you're used to, the temperature scale that you're used to, will never be functional in physics. Fahrenheit, no way. No calculations will be done using the Fahrenheit scale. So there are at least three scales that you have to get used to. Fahrenheit, you already know. But what's the melting point of ice on the Fahrenheit scale? Uh, that's the boiling point of water. It's 212. Negative. No, 212. Positive 212. And the melting point of ice is 32 Fahrenheit. So on the Fahrenheit scale, that's what you see now. You see that the, where is it? Oh, this is refusing. OK. 32 is the melting point of ice. At 180, 212 is the boiling point of water at 180. So that means there are 180 equal parts. But on the Celsius scale, what is the melting point of ice? Zero. Zero degrees Celsius, and the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. So there are 100 parts here. On the Kelvin scale, which is the one that you have to always use, if ever in doubt, Kelvin scale will always work in any problem, any equation. All right. Fahrenheit will never work. Celsius will work if the formula includes a change in temperature. See that if the formula has any kind of change in temperature, Celsius will work. But Kelvin will always work. On the Kelvin scale, melting point of ice is 273 and the boiling point of water is 373. But do you know how to convert from one to the other? So just add, like, add, a, add 315? Add 32. But before we get to the that, you know, usually the definition of temperature is kind of wrong. I've seen it defined as the degree of hotness or coldness. That's not, that's not right. Temperature is the average kinetic energy of molecules. That's the definition that I want you to have. Because when you heat any substance, the molecules are going to pick up kinetic energy, they're going to become faster, and temperature is actually a measure of the average kinetic energy of molecules. Just wanted to tell you, you know that the human body temperature, normal temperature is 98.6 Fahrenheit, right? Just wanted to point out that it's 37 degrees Celsius. And that is 310.15 Kelvin, normal body temperature. And here again, you see the freezing point of water is 32 on the Fahrenheit, zero on the Celsius, and approximately 273 on the Kelvin. See that? And then the boiling point of water is 212, 100, and 373. This is how you change from Celsius to Fahrenheit. So, for example, if you substitute 100 here, what do you get? 100. 100 divided by 5 will cross out, cancel out for 20, right? 20 times 9 is 180, plus 32 gives you 212. So 100 Celsius is 212 Fahrenheit. But how do you convert back from Fahrenheit to Celsius? That's why you have to be careful. It's 5 by 9, but did you notice something there? You notice? It's the opposite. It is the opposite, but you have to first subtract 32 before you multiply with 5 and divide by 9. OK? How do you change from Celsius to Kelvin? Plus 273. Plus 273. Everybody knows that. And this is just an example of that I told you just now. If C is 100, uh, you get 212. Is there any temperature? at which the Fahrenheit and the Celsius are equal. Like you get the same number for both. 
How would you be able to find that if I had asked you that as a question? All you have to do is, in this equation, just put an F here. Because I said C would be equal to F, didn't I say? So just make this also an F and solve. Go ahead, solve it. Write this equation and put an F here, so you have F here, and then get the answer quickly. All right, so if you want to find the temperatures at which they're equal, here it is. I just assumed F is negative 40, and I'm just proving it. But to find out, you just put F is equal to C and do, do it. I just proved it, right? What is so special about the Kelvin scale? Anything special about the Kelvin scale? What's the lowest temperature on the Kelvin scale? Zero. zero. And that's called the absolute zero because the Kelvin scale is also called the absolute scale. That means in the Kelvin scale, you have no negative temperatures, which is good. No negative, right? So that is very important to know. And this is how you change from Celsius to Kelvin, you know, just add 273, get that. You'll be doing that multiple times. So no negative temperatures in the Kelvin scale. So when you work out a problem and you get minus 15 Kelvin, you know that you're wrong. That's what I'm trying to say. You cannot get a negative temperature in Kelvin scale. The lowest temperature possible is zero Kelvin. And scientists have reached very close to that. Maybe like 0.19 Kelvin to go to hit zero. And at that point, it's so tough. That's very cold, you know what I'm trying to say. And to measure that temperature is even tougher. How do you measure that? So you have the equipment, you have to have the equipment to take you that far, and also equipment to measure that, you see that? And they just have the door frame and the door. And this was constructed in spring, for example, and whoever constructed it made it exact fit. It means there's no big gap and all that. So come summer or winter, we're going to have a problem. In one of these seasons, the door is going to jam. Because you know that whenever solids are heated, they expand, right? Come on. So now I want you to think properly and tell me in which season is the door going to jam? Think. So you required three seconds for thinking. Okay. Now, if you said summer, how many people want to say winter? Because you said things are. They, oh. Couldn't they have been, uh, both of them? Both of them? Okay. So now there are three answers. And there's a fourth answer neither. <coughs> <laughs> but why do you say winter? The heat is going to be on inside. I don't know if that's uh, it's yeah. not hot enough. No, we're talking about summer in the sense that the temperature is higher. That's what we mean. Okay. So like the door contracts, like the frame? In winter? Yeah. In winter, both contract. Yeah, so, uh, so both will contract, and in summer, both will expand. Oh, so, so, so what was your question again? Oh, in uh, summer. <laughs> yes. Uh, then summer because if both of them contract, then like there should be the extra room that the door creates, the um, the frame goes in. But in summer, it contracts and, and like against each other. You know what I mean? Uh, in summer, both expand. In winter, yeah, both contract. Now the thing is, will both expand equally in summer? Do they have the same original length? Which one is at least slightly bigger originally? The door, frame. the door frame. Don't you think that the expansion depends on the original length? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The door frame being a little bigger than the door in summer will expand a little bit more than the door. So there will be a gap. But come winter, so you're right, two of you who said winter are right, though you couldn't give the right explanation. In winter, both will contract, but the door frame will contract more. So I'm just trying to tell you that expansion of a solid depends on its original length. That's all I tried to say. What else does it depend on? Expansion depends on its original length. Doesn't it depend on the material? 
Yes, it depends on it on the material. So we're going to introduce a constant called alpha, which is called linear expansivity. And it also depends on the change in temperature. Expansion depends on three things. Or the change in length depends on three things. Number one, the original length. Two, the material. Three, the change in temperature. When you put all of them together, that's the formula that you get. Change in length. Alpha is either called a linear expansivity or it is called a coefficient of linear expansion. L0 is the original length. Delta T is the change in temperature. Okay, all right. That is very clear, isn't it? Can you tell me the unit of alpha? The unit of alpha? Both of these are in meters, isn't it? This is in Kelvin. So when you switch sides, alpha is going to be per Kelvin or per degree Celsius. That's not a common unit. So per degree Celsius or per So alpha over K. Yeah, alpha is a symbol and unit is per Celsius. Okay, uh, on the left hand side, what you see is something that uh, we use day in and day out, but we don't recognize it. It's called a thermostat. What is a thermostat? Thermostat? Maintain the temperature. Uh, the best example would be an automatic iron. It switches on and off automatically, you know that, right? You put it at the setting, whether it's cotton or silk, you're trying to iron, so. You see it's switching off, and then after some time, it'll switch on back again, so it does that using this little piece of equipment. What it is, it's uh, two different metals revetted together, so they can't separate, and they have different alphas. That means they expand differently. This is how they look at a certain temperature, say room temperature. But when heated, they bend. Can you tell me why? Where they bend? One expands more than Which one expands more? The blue. the blue expands more than the yellow. So actually there would be an electrical connection somewhere here. That's what I had drawn before and then it went off. Anyway, so if there was an electric contact here, uh, now, right now, it's broken, right? Because it's moved away. So there is no circuit. No, the circuit is not made. So the current is switched off. It cools. When it cools, it returns and touches there, makes contact, and again the current flows until it gets heated up again. Is that clear? So that is the automatic switching that happens. So continuously, it's like, mm, you know, not that fast, but slowly and then back and forth. My question is, what if you cool it to a temperature below this? What would happen? Oh, this is what happens when you heat it, right? If you cool it to a temperature below T naught, how would this be? My question is, which one will contract more? Definitely, the one that expands more always contracts more. That's a law of nature. Therefore, yeah, like somebody said, couldn't make out who, it will bend the other way. You with me? That's expansion. So now I have a favorite question to ask you. I think of a Titan, is it on the, okay. And you would read it. No, you will read it. So here is the thing. If you have a metal plate, a metal plate like that, and I cut a hole, a circular hole in it, and remove the material, it's a metal, remove it, and I heat this plate, what will happen to the size of the hole? 
counted. You answered in like three seconds. I was counting. That's not time enough for you to think. What will happen to the size of the hole? Hmm? You're heating it. When you heat it, what will happen to the size of the hole? Will it stay the same? Will it stay the same? Well, I mean, expand like symmetrically. What will happen to the size of the hole? What will happen to the radius of the hole? I hear bigger, I hear smaller, I hear nothing will happen. I think it'll stay the same. Yeah, I heard it again. Nothing will happen. Now I want to ask you this. All metals expand when heated. Some more than the others, but all do expand. And I said I'm heating it. So of course it has to change. Don't tell me that nothing will happen. Most of the time the answer that I hear is that the hole will shrink. That's the answer that I hear most. Which is wrong. I'll tell you why. Because if I did not cut a hole and I just drew a circle with a marker, okay, and I heat it, what will happen to the size of that circle that I've drawn? Get bigger. Now everybody finds it easy to say it'll get bigger. Well, whether I cut it out or not, it's got to get bigger. <laughs> you see? So the hole becomes bigger, never smaller. So, Mar, you're right. It'll become bigger, yeah. So you know why doesn't it expand inward and outward? <laughs> That's a generational question. You know, I've heard that like over generations. It expands. But like when I asked you, when you draw a circle mm -hmm. and you heat it, what is going to happen? Everybody's clear that this circle will become bigger, right? Now, so you having that material there or not having it doesn't make any mistake. It's always, and any difference I mean, it's, it's going to be the same. I'll give you an example. Uh, horse carts, the wheels are made, let's say the wheels are made of wood, but you can't have it run on the road with wood, it'll get chipped off easily. So they have an iron tire on that. You know how they fit that iron tire on wood? Initially, the, the radius of the iron tire is the same as that of the wooden wheel. They're the same. The iron tire is heated to a very high temperature. What is going to happen to its radius when you heat it to a very high temperature? Okay, now you find it easy to say it'll get bigger? Okay, thank you. And while it is still hot, you place it on the wooden wheel. Well, like you don't have to do anything now. It when it cools, it'll shrink and fit so hard and fast that you're never able to remove it after that unless you heat it back to the original temperature. That's what they do. That's called, that is called the tightest fit ever. So did that make it a little bit clearer? It, it expands, it doesn't shrink when heated. Okay. But when you talk about a metal plate, you're talking about its area increasing, not the length increasing. So I want you to notice this formula, change in area. It's again the same type of formula, right? Original area. But you notice that the constant now is what? Two times alpha. And so too, if it's a, a cube, then its volume will increase. Right? If it's a cube, if it's a three-dimensional object, its volume will increase. And that is the formula for change in volume. It's approximately volume times three alpha times delta T. Question, which of these three, I mean, we looked at change in length, change in area, and change in volume, which of these three can you relate to fluids? Volume. That's it. Fluids cannot undergo a change in length, it has no sense, change in length or area. So metals, solids, all three, yeah. But fluids, only change in volume. We also not need to remember that change in length is called linear expansion, because you might see this and you have to know change in area is called superficial expansion. The word superficial means air surface, so surface area changing, and change in volume is called cubicle expansion. expansion. Cubicle. Means volume. There you go.
That is about expansion. Can you repeat what superficial means? It means surface area, because it's the surface area that changes. The whole surface becomes bigger. Surface. Suddenly another question came to my mind. If you imagine that you have a, a thermometer, like alcohol thermometer, you know, alcohol in glass thermometers, which will have a bulb at the bottom. Haven't you seen a thermometer? You have a bulb and a, a capillary tube, a thin tube. If you immerse this into some hot liquid, immerse the bulb into the hot liquid, and I will draw it. I need to draw it here so people can see it. So if you take that, there's a very rough diagram. I can't even draw straight now. Okay. Highly magnified bulb. Ooh, that's why I never tried to draw. Okay, and let's say that the alcohol is right up to this level A. Right there. You put it into that uh, liquid, hot liquid, whose temperature you want to measure. You're going to see, if you watch very carefully, you will see that the alcohol level goes down first. And then, over time, it goes up. My question is, why does it drop from A to B? It's a real easy one to answer. Thank you. Because the heat first gets into the solid, which is the glass bulb. And the glass bulb has an increase in volume, so the liquid level drops. See that? And then the liquid expands. Which one expands more, glass or the liquid? Liquid. Liquid. That's why it goes from B to C. So my, again, the next question is, so what is the real expansion of the liquid? How much did the liquid actually expand? Is it from A to C or B to C? Right? So that is the real expansion of the liquid. But what you see, because we're not going to be watching it all the time, we will not see it dropping first, you see? So we will think, oh, it went up from A to C. You know what I'm saying? So that you have to be careful always. This is called, that is what it appears to be, it's called the apparent expansion. Apparent expansion. The word apparent means what it appears to be. What is AB? What is AB? AB is how much the glass bulb expanded, isn't it? So what is the relation there? You got a relation there. Real expansion is equal to apparent expansion plus, plus, come on, cubicle expansion. What is apparent? Apparent. Cubical expansion of glass. You know, I want to speed it up so we can go home on time. Uh, looking at if they should fit, the diameters must become equal, right? That is very clear. So what should be the change in length? The difference. The difference. Whatever the difference is. And that's the formula we're using. I've just rearranged it. Because delta L is just L minus L naught. I didn't need, I need not have done that. I could have just put it as delta. See, you can do this problem. You can first find the change in temperature. That's fine, and then you can do it. I just try to do it all together. But you can find the change in temperature and do it. So do you see the alpha of steel there? Don't? 12 times 10 to the negative 6. It is small. Metals don't expand so much. It's really, really small. That is the alpha. 
Of course, this is the original length, isn't it? 1.871, isn't that the original? Yeah. So that's the L0 you see and the alpha is here. So when you work that out, get minus 69 degrees Celsius. Because it should contract, isn't it? Because the original is 1.871 and you want it to go down to 1.869. See, you want it to become smaller. So that's why it's a negative temperature. While you were doing this problem, I was thinking about the expansion of a solid is so small. You see the alpha? Yeah. It's so small. But why do they have to have those big gaps in the railroad? Have you seen those big gaps in the railroad? That's obviously why you, when you travel on a train, it makes a noise. Each time the steel tires fall into that gap, it's like tick, tick, tick. You see the gap is big. Why should the gap be big? Because it's like a lot, it's like miles and miles of metal. A lot of friction. It's a, lot, it's a bigger one. The original length is bigger. That being said, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge, which is really long, expands in summer by about three feet. That is a lot, three feet. The alpha is small, but I'm trying to tell you that the expansion depends on the original length. So you have to have some kind of mechanism. You have to have gaps so in summer it has space to expand. Driving on concrete roads, man, it's, I hate it. Because, you know, it makes that noise. And you know why? Because you can't have miles of concrete. It's going to expand in summer. So you have those gaps, and they fill that gap with something which is not obviously the same. Because, again, it expands more than the concrete and bulges out. You see, that's why each time you drive on concrete, it makes that noise. Same thing with the driveway. You know that you have gaps and filled with wood or something. I don't want to talk about it. So everything expands, and you have to make provision for that. Bridges, buildings. If you don't, oh, it'll come down. Because the stress created when anything expands, the stress is big, big enough to build, bring that building down. So that's a very important engineering concern. Whenever you build anything, you got to think about in summer what's going to happen. It's going to expand. Calculate the space and leave it. Okay. And they would have to calculate the temperature. Of in this question, because the change in length is going to be proportional to the temperature, right? Yeah. So if it goes from eleven point eight two to twenty two point eight five. You just find the difference, and that is the difference for a change of 100 degrees Celsius. So for 1 degree Celsius, it would be that divided by 100. And once you get the change for 1 degree Celsius, you can find the change for anything. That's right. That's how you do it. The change in length is proportional to the temperature, isn't it? That's what I've written. And then you set it up as a ratio. See what I did. So based on what I did, the units are going to be Celsius per centimeter, see? Because I divided delta T by the change in length. So Celsius per centimeter. That means if it increases in length by one centimeter, the temperature changed by 9.066 Celsius. Knowing that, I know that the temperature corresponding for any length should be given by this formula. Just, just made this form. If the length is L meters, temperature should be given by, why do I start with zero? What is that? Where, that, where did that zero come from? Initial. Yep, yep. So, a and B, just for A, substitute this as how much? 16.70 and B, 20.50, and you have the answer. So, temperature when the length is 16.70, that's what I mean by that. Okay. It's not a multiplication, temperature. And
To finish the section, I have to talk about the most abundant surf, uh, substance on the surface of the earth, which is? Carbon. Water. Water. <laughs> okay. What's the most abundant one in the body, human body? Water. Almost 75% of the earth and 75% of the human body is water. Think about that. Water has some amazing properties. We're going to look at one, two, three properties tonight. One of them is, how do I bring this? If you take a piece of ice, block of ice, and melt it, what will happen to the volume of ice after it melts completely and becomes water? Reduces. Volume goes down. So that means ice has a bigger volume than water. And because density is mass by volume, that means ice has a smaller density than water. Are you with me? That's why ice floats. Got it? Ice has a density of about 920 kilogram per meter cube. Water, fresh water has a density of 1,000 kilogram per meter cube. Okay, so let's continue the story. So you just melted a piece of ice, the volume went down, right? Now heat it. Continue heating the water. What's going to happen to the volume? No, it won't. It'll, it'll contract. It's a special property of water. All other liquids, when you heat them, they have to expand, right? But not water. When you heat water from zero up to four degrees Celsius, it's going to contract instead of expanding. Is that like when it's frozen? No, I'm talking about zero to four. Zero to four degrees Celsius. Oh, okay. After so, yeah, it has its minimum volume at four degrees Celsius. Means water has maximum density at four degrees Celsius. So I'll show you a graph that gives the density of fresh water. Take a look at this graph. The density is given in one gram. It's given in gram per centimeter cube. That's why you see one. Do you see what's happening to the density? That's the temperature scale. What's happening to the density here? Is it increasing? Yeah. Yes. And do you see that at four degrees Celsius, the density became maximum? That's what I'm talking, to, talking about. And then it behaves like any other liquid. If you continue heating it after four degrees Celsius, yeah, it, like any other liquid, it'll expand which means its volume increases, density decreases. So between zero and four, water has this amazing property. And I want to talk a little bit more about that because it's very interesting what this property can go do. Okay. Another property of water is why, can we, can we use water in the radiators of cars? Okay, now you're going to say it's a coolant because it's an antifreeze. Who needs antifreeze in Texas? Come on. <laughs> no, never mind. But that also has a, some anti-rust properties, so you should use a coolant, okay? But my question is, in third world countries, nobody uses a coolant. It's just water. Will it work? A coolant is basically water. Did you know that? It works, yeah. With some additives. How is water able to function in a radiator. Shouldn't, be, shouldn't it be able to absorb a lot of heat because it's cooling the engine? Yeah. yeah. Water is capable of absorbing a lot of heat before its temperature increases. Are you listening? Yeah. We're gonna, I'm going to introduce a new term called specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity or specific heat. The specific heat of water is really high. It's about 4,186 joules. 4,186 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Let me explain. If you have one kilogram of water, one kilogram of water is not much, right? One kilogram of water is not much. And you want to heat it from 20 degrees Celsius to 21. What is the change in temperature? 
Only. Okay, so you're listening. Thank you. So just for a change in one degree Celsius, you have to give it 4,186 joules. That's what you mean by specific heat. And that is huge. That's a big... Let me compare it with that of copper. Copper gets heated fast, you know that. All metals. Because they have a low specific heat. Copper is like 385. So one kilogram of copper, you give it 385 joules, its temperature will go up by one Celsius. You see that? Aluminum is like 900. So which one gets heated up faster, copper or aluminum? Copper. Yeah, copper. Lower the specific heat, the faster it gets heated. That is a blessing. Lower. Not in disguise. Lower the specific heat, the faster the temperature increases. Right? It's like saying some people are not uh, satisfied with little food. Bad example, but true one. So their specific heats are high. They need a lot of food to feel full. You know, well, you know I, I'm trying to give you an example. So metals are like satisfied with little. You know why this is a blessing? Have you ever heard of people falling into a lake in Texas in summer and dying because they get burnt? Water has a big specific heat. So in summer, which part is going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, during the daytime, is it the ground or is it the water that's going to be warmer? The ground. The ground. Why? Water has a big specific heat, so its temperature will not go up so quickly. So you can jump into the water mid-summer noon. You can, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, come night. So let's say at 8 p.m., the sun has been down for like three hours now. Well, if it's summer, it's not been. But still, okay, let's say 11 p.m. 11, yeah, at night. And then, which is going to be warmer? The water or the ground? Water. The water. Because whatever heats up slowly also cools slowly. Are you getting what I'm saying? This brings up, uh, I didn't plan to do this, so this brings up a, a new phenomenon. Now, you have heard about this. I'm sure everybody's heard about this. If you have the sea here and the land here during the daytime, which did you say is warmer? Land. land. So the air above the land rises because anything gets warmer, its density decreases, and the breeze from the sea the cold breeze flows to take its place. That's why we love going to the beach during the daytime. Because when you stand at the beach, the cool air... Is anybody getting what I'm saying? The cooler air from the ocean is hitting us. It's like a natural fan, and we're like, oh. But come night, what's going to happen? Which part is cooler? Uh, night, which part is cooler? The land is cooler, the sea is warmer, so the air is going to go. That's how you get the sea breeze and the land breeze. Haven't you studied about this in school? Okay, that's what I'm teaching you. So if you're like sailboat, will you like go faster? You would. Like going away from the land? Yes, of course. Depends on the wind direction. But again, there are techniques where they know how to steer it by changing the angle and all that. But definitely, yes. So that is just about specific heat. Or right, let's go back to the real thing, the specific heat thing. What is the specific heat of water, did I say? Nobody got it. 4,100. 4, oh, I missed that. I just hit. Good. M, C, delta T. Q stands for quantity of heat. Oh. No, I can't even spell quantity. Of heat. M is the mass. C is the specific heat. Delta T is the change in temperature. Yeah, I mean, if you have, for example, if you have five kilograms of water at 
20 degrees Celsius and you want to heat it to 21 degrees Celsius, how much heat do you need? And go ahead. How do you calculate Q? 5 times C is 4,186 for what? Specific heat of water. What's the change in temperature? 1 degree Celsius. Multiply those two numbers, please, and tell me. 1,927. Thank you. Joules. That's how you do that. That makes sense? All right. If that made sense and you don't have a question, do you have a question? No. Let's go to another question. Suppose you have two kilograms of hot water at 90 degrees Celsius. You mix it with one kilogram of cold water at 20 degrees Celsius. Mix them up. Assuming that no heat is lost to the surroundings, what will be their final maximum temperature? Like after you mix the hot and the cold, what will their final maximum temperature be? So TF, what is the final maximum temperature? The final temperature should be closer to 90. Why? Because you have two kilogram of hot water. So, Well, how do we really do this? And this is a very important thing. This is going to be a 10-point question, not just this one. It's leading. So when you mix a hot object and a cold object, the hot object loses heat, and the cold object gains heat. But by the conservation of energy, quantity of heat lost plus the quantity of heat gained should add up to Yeah, conservation of energy. That means whatever the hot object lost, if the hot object lost 50 joules, the cold object should gain 50 joules because energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Isn't that what I've written? Or if you take it to the other side, so that's going to be an important equation. So let's use that to do this problem, and I'll work it out and just pay attention. Which one loses heat? The hot water. And what's the formula for quantity of heat? Mass times? All right, so two times, 4186 times change in temperature. When you take the change, it's always going to be final minus initial. We don't have final. So we will call it TF. What is the initial? 90. 90. Isn't it? It's equal to minus, okay, go ahead. What's the mass? One. One. Specific heat? Same thing because it's water. And final temperature? Yeah. Minus? 20. 20. Now, if you look at my YouTube videos, you're going to find a change. See, I get rid of this negative by reversing this. Instead of putting a negative, can't you just reverse it? That's what I've done in my previous YouTube videos. See, so if you see that, and say, oh, you made a mistake. No, I did not. Okay, so calculate this. Uh, can we cancel this? We can, right? Wrong. So you get 2TF. Minus 180 is equal to, there is negative here, so negative TF plus 20. And then, so that means 3 TF is equal to 200. That implies TF is 200 by 3. How much is 200 by 3? 
180 by 360, so 20, 67, no, 66, 66.7, mm -hmm. that is the answer, problem done. All right, take a look at this graph. What's on the x-axis? Barely readable, I know. Yeah, so quantity of heat on the x-axis. On the y-axis, temperature. All right, what is the temperature here? We're talking about ice. We're talking about water. So at negative 20, what do you have? Is it water or is it ice? ice? Yeah, it's cold ice. So if you start heating ice, which is at negative 20, will it melt? After, after, after a while. What, what do you mean by after a while? When it gets cold, it starts. It's kind of go will it start melting when it's at negative 20 and you start heating it? No, no because the melting point of ice is zero so first what's going to happen is ice is going to have an increase in temperature from negative 20 all the way to zero isn't that what you see there so at, zero, it's at zero if you continue heating it'll start melting but once ice starts melting there will be no change in temperature until all of the ice has melted this is a very important point, I'm telling you. You're heating a block of ice until the last molecule of ice has changed into water. The temperature is not going to change. So where's all the heat going? The heat is going to change the state. It's called a phase change. Because aren't you changing a solid to a liquid? Where, do, where are the molecules more tightly bound? Solid. In a solid. So don't you require energy to break those molecular bonds, the strong bonds, and make it a liquid? That's where it's going. This heat is called the latent heat. L-A-T-E-N-T. -T. The word latent means hidden. It's hidden to a thermometer. So if you have a thermometer there, while there is a phase change, and you ask the thermometer, hey, is there a temperature change? It'll say, no. Are you getting any heat? No. Because the heat is not being used to change the kinetic energy of the molecules, it's used to break the molecular bonds. So much. That's why here you see, is that? That's the melting process, no change. All right, after all the ice is melted, if you continue heating, what's going to happen? It will. The temperature will increase until it begins to boil. boil. You see that it's 100 degrees Celsius? Once again, once it reaches 100 degrees Celsius, you continue heating it, no change in temperature, because now there is another phase change taking place. Water is changing into steam. The liquid is changing into vapor, correct? That is called vaporization. Look at that. But why is that a longer process? Oh, that means it needs more heat, correct? You see that this is a smaller region which is easier to change ice into water or to change water into steam ice, ice into water. yeah easier <laughs> so you have two latent heats here one is called the latent heat of fusion fusion means melting and the latent heat of fusion is 3.36 times 10 to the 6 uh, sorry 10 to the 5 joules per kilogram that is the latent heat of fusion, LF. Latent heat of vaporization is 2.256 times 10 to the 6. See that it's much bigger, don't you? Which burns are going to be tougher. Boiling water burns. Steam. May you never be burnt, but which is going to be bad. Bad, bad. Real bad. Steam. Boiling water or steam burns. Why? It's a lot hotter. Uh, no. Both are at 100 degrees Celsius. What's the temperature of boiling water? 100 degrees Celsius. What's the temperature of steam? 
100 degrees Celsius. But steam has its latent heat in it. You know what I mean? It's already taken its latent heat. And if it falls on the skin, all the latent heat is released. So the 2.256 million joules, it's going to be on your skin. Ah, there's a lot of heat. Ah, there's a lot of, lot of heat. And um, I was thinking about something and I said, should I say this? This will start another story. Grandma knew, grandma knew when she was cooking food, although she did not know physics, she knew that once water begins to boil, the food in it will not get cooked anymore. Because once water begins to boil, it becomes selfish. It's like it needs its latent heat, right? It'll absorb all the heat. And if you have, like, for example, potatoes in it, I don't know why people will eat potatoes, but it, it won't get any more cooked. So what would grandma do? She would either lower the flame, because you're wasting fuel, or she would pour more cold water into it. If you pour more cold water, what happens? The boiling stops, the temperature goes down to, let's say, 95, so there's another period where it has to come back to 100. During that time, the potatoes get cooked. Grandma knew that. So you do not want water to boil if you want food to be cooked. Are you listening? That's the invention. That led to the invention of the pressure cooker. Because in a pressure cooker, because the pressure builds up, the boiling point of water is not 100. It's more than 100. Let's say it's 110. So water will not boil until it reaches 110. By that time, the food is cooked. And we needed a pressure cooker because otherwise people in higher altitudes would never be able to cook their food. Because at higher altitudes, the pressure is less, right? And water there boils below 100. Are you listening? Like 94, 96, 97. <laughs> they will never get their food cooked. That's why we had to go in for a pressure cooker, but now we've started using, started using it, and it really cooks faster. Do you know that? Really fast. So that being the latent heat of ice, if I have uh, five kilograms of ice at negative 10 degrees Celsius, how much heat is required to melt it? Will I start melting at minus 10? No. No. So first what happens? It goes down. It goes down. It goes up. It goes up from minus 10 to 0. I know. You got, okay, goes up from minus 10 to? Okay, how do you find the quantity of heat required to change it from minus 10 to 0? Minus 10 to 0. Okay, for that you use Q is equal to MC delta T. Okay, go ahead. What is mass? What is the mass? 5. What is the specific heat? I got you. That is the specific heat of water. What are you heating? Are you heating water? Ice. ice. So you need the specific heat of ice, which will be given to you. It's 2100. What is the change in temperature? You see how you can go wrong there? Like people will be like, ice, water, same thing. No, they're not the same. Yeah, because it's 0 minus minus 10, isn't it, which is 10. So that means it is going to be 10 times 50. Oh, how much is that? 2,100 times 50. Uh, right, 105,000 joules. Is that the answer? No. That is just to get it up to melting point. And now what? Yeah, you have to melt it. So how much heat do you need to melt it? Uh, 
No, no, no. What is this quantity? Means what? The amount of heat required to melt one kilogram of ice. Right. So the formula is mass times, oh, wrong pen. Mass times latent heat. That's the new formula. But be careful, you use that only for a phase change, you see? So now what you do? That is 5 times, 3.36 times, 10 to the 5. All right, give me this. Hmm. Nathaniel. Three point three six times five. Thirty eighteen fifty. Is this the number? I got one million six hundred thousand seven. Six seven five. Is that? Okay. One six seven five. Is that what you get? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. You get that number? Yeah, That's what I wrote first. Yeah. You made me. <laughs> That's what I wrote first. One, six, eight. How many zeros? Three? Four. 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 Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I got you. I remember you. Or right, add those two numbers, you get the total heat. And this is not going up on YouTube. It's live recording. No, so, <laughs> I add both. What do you get? Uh, All right, for the sake of those who are listening to this, this is question number five. On the problem set, heat and first law of thermodynamics. Okay, so in that question, first step is ice has to melt. Quantity of heat gained for ice to no, ice to get heated from, from what? From to zero degrees Celsius. Right, quickly, Q is equal to MC delta T. What's the mass? Mass of ice? That's what you're trying to find. So is the heat of ice? 2100. Change in temperature? Zero minus minus 8.5, which is? Okay, that's quantity of heat gained. Next step, quantity of heat gained to melt, isn't it? Formula, mass times, latent heat, isn't it? Which is M times 3.36 times 10 to the 5. Third step, quantity of heat gained by the, the water that's formed when ice melts. That water has to go up. So the formula is MC delta T, M times, somebody help me with the C now. Because it's water. Times change in temperature, please. 17, because it goes from 0 to 17. So 17 minus 0. Okay. Now you add all the three. Total quantity of heat gained is equal to, I'll wait for you to give me that number. That's what you get for total heat gained. Now what about uh, heat lost? Which are the two that lose heat? The aluminum and the water in it, right? Don't they go through the same change of temperature? So I'm going to write them both together. You see what I'm going to do? I don't want to split it into two steps. I can do it together. What's the mass? What is the mass of the, the calorimeter there? 95 grams? Mm -hmm. So that will be point oh Yeah, you have to. Yeah. 95 times uh, aluminum is 900. It will be given to you. Plus mass of water in it, 310. 0.310 kilogram times the specific heat of water is 4186. Change in temperature? 
Both were at 20, they went to 17. Uh, final takeaway, initial, negative three. Got to be careful. Final is 17, the initial is 20, isn't it? All right, what is that number? Negative something, I know. Four thousand one hundred and forty-nine. That's all. 48. And then four eight. No. Yeah. Point four eight. Yeah. Okay. So what do we do now? Q G is equal to minus Q times. You can put the negative on one of the any side. You know. So that'll get rid of the negative and make it also positive. So that means the last step is four two five zero one two m is equal to four one four nine point four eight. So the mass is number. This is the formula for conduction. Explain the terms, please. What is this? The quantity of heat conducted in T seconds. See? So that is the rate of conduction of heat. K is a constant called thermal conductivity. It is a constant for each material. Metals are obviously good conductors. So K, K value will be higher. It's called thermal conductivity. What is A? Area. Of? So if it's a rod, are you talking about the surface area or are you talking about the area of cross-section? Cross-section. Cross section. So what would be the shape of the cross-section for a rod? Circle, so it would be pi r squared, right? Mm -hmm. So remember, A is the area of cross-section. TH and TC are the temperatures of the hot end and the cold end. And D is the Distance, which would be the length of the rod in this case. All right. Length of the rod. Oh. So, to give you an example, if you're talking about your window in summer, I said a lot of heat comes in through the windows, right? What would A be there? No, no, no. It's the area of the window. Uh -oh. People like to have big windows. I'm trying to say that's a problem. If you have like six windows all around your home, that's a lot of area. You see what I'm saying? Because where you don't have the windows, you have brick, right? Or something else, whatever. And you have the insulation. Isn't it thicker? And the window is like one or two millimeters glass. Oh, more the number of windows, more heat coming in. That's why the AC doesn't stop working in summer. Okay, in that case, what's the TH? The outside temperature. What is TC? Inside. Inside temperature at which you set your AC. So if you set your AC at a really low temperature, the difference is bigger, so it'll be working more. You know, are you getting what I'm trying to say? What is D? What is D? of the glass. Would you use thick glass or thin glass? Yeah. Thick. But well, you don't have a choice. You just bought your home with that thin glass. So contractors always so try to save money. The different are made out of like, like glass. They so the whole house is made of glass? No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there is yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, most of the part is like, but that's thicker glass, and they would save by using curtains. Mm -hmm. Or what I did in 2009, I'll never forget this. I decided to put solar films on the, on the windows inside. It looked fabulous until the grass on my lawn behind my home dried out. And they, it dried out in, in perfect designs. You know why? Because the grass near the home was now getting heat in two ways the direct heat from the sun uh, and the reflected heat, not making this up. That's actually cool. And I saw it dry up and I could see you know, how the grass dries up in that pattern. 
And soon enough, once the grass begins to dry, it, it spreads, you know, disease prone and all that because it's not healthy anymore. So the whole yard was gone. I regretted it. But now it's been like so many years and I've saved money. I, I immediately saw the electricity bill come down that summer. It was immediate. Let's try doing that. That's an option. If you have a lot of money, you can replace the windows and uh, put your know, double pane windows and fill it with argon or something, which is better than air. But if you don't, if you're like me, that's what you do. Put so so solar films. Did something catch your attention? If you are reading really, you know, in-depth understanding, the first sentence itself should have caught your attention. A hundred, yeah? It's uh, not a solid surface? Mm -hmm. The light bulb? No, not that. Just look at it. What's the power of the light bulb? And how much heat is it producing? So how much light is it producing? That is practically true for a light bulb. With all respects to Thomas Alva Edison, he tested 2,000 materials before he got us the light bulb. But the light bulb is actually supposed to be called a heat bulb because it produces 95% of heat and 5% of light. So you better change all the lights in your home to LEDs. The initial cost, that's what I've done. The initial cost is a little higher, but in two years you save a lot of money. And in 10 years, because they will last like 15 years at least, you save a lot of money. If you're still using those, like for decorative purposes, we still need light bulbs on the chandeliers, you know what I mean? You, you need that, but you can't have an LED on there. But they're coming up with fashionable LEDs too. Try to replace it. I mean, oh, you can, you can just forget to switch off the LEDs. You can leave them on. Because all of the LEDs together will consume less than one light bulb. I'm telling you. So look at that problem. 100 watt light bulb produces 95 watts of heat. What is Q? Q is the quantity of heat. Hey, 95. Q is 95. What's the time? Huh? What? No, what's the time? Time. Because you have Q over T. I'm not going to tell you. Huh? Why? Because it's a... It is a second. Because one uh, what? Yeah, one watt is one joule per second. So when you say ninety-five watts, you're actually saying you're not giving Q; you're giving Q over T. Everybody got that? All right, let's move on. What's A? What is A? Uh, is it sphere? Sphere. What's the area of a sphere? Four, three, four. four pi r squared. 4 pi r squared. Oh, okay. 4 third pi r cubed is a volume. Okay, 4 pi r squared. Okay, uh, do you know the temperature difference? Is that what we have to find? What do we have to find? Yeah. So you're looking for delta T, right? TH minus TC, that's what you're trying to find. What is D? D. So that should be in meters. So that's 10 to the negative 3. And now you should be able to finish that problem. You should be able to knock it off. Oh, you need the K off? Hey, wouldn't it be one, one to negative three? Yeah, that is the same as 10 to the net. Who needs the one? <laughs> yeah. OK. Uh, you need the K of glass. K of glass is 0 0.84. What? Meter raised to minus 1. K raised to minus 1. So now it's 95 is equal to 0 0.84 times. Anybody found the area? 
Okay, I'm going to say 4 pi. What was the radius? So 0 0.03 squared. What? Did you actually find the area? Okay, I just plugged in 4 pi r squared. That's okay. So th minus tc is what you're looking for, divided by thickness is 10 to the negative 3. And uh, rearrange th minus tc would be 95 times 10 to the negative 3 divided by 0.84 times 4 pi times 0 0.03 squared. I think the and answer comes to be about 10 this. degrees Celsius. All right, we come to radiation and the quantity of heat radiated per second depends on the nature and color of the surface. It depends on the surface area, the temperature of the object, the radiating object, the temperature of the surroundings, and on a constant called Stefan's constant. So this is the formula for heat radiated and A is the area of the surface remember it is the surface area E is what represents the nature and color of the surface and it's called emissivity and for a perfectly black object it's 1 and for a white polished object it is 0 so black dull surface is 1 and white polished surface is 0. All other objects, the emissivity is, will lie between 0 and 1. And uh, T raised to 4, T is the temperature of the uh, radiating object and Ts is the temperature of its surroundings that you see here. And you also have a constant sigma, which is called Stefan, Stefan's constant. And actually, this law is called Stefan Boltzmann law. So here is the constant, that is Stefan's constant. There's a value of 5.67 times 10 to the negative 8. Watt meter raised to minus 2, Kelvin raised to minus 4. So that is the formula that is used to find the heat quantity of heat radiated in one second. A is the surface area, E is the emissivity, sigma is Stefan's constant, that's the value. T naught here is the temperature of the radiating object. T S is the temperature of the surroundings. And in this uh, formula, the temperature has to be taken in Kelvin. So this is the problem where you have a 60 watt uh, electric lamp, its temperature is given as uh, 338 Kelvin and uh, you are asked to find the temperature of a 150 watt electric lamp. And both of these only radiate 90% of the heat, um, energy as heat. So that is why you have 0.9 times 60 because that's the amount of heat radiated per second for the first one. And both of them are in the same uh, surroundings. That's the surrounding temperature in Kelvin. So for the second one, which is 150 watt uh, bulb, you have the same thing except you're trying to find the temperature of the bulb. So you have those two equations, one and two, divide one by the other and uh, you get these terms cancelled, so does 0.9, and so you're left with this. And now when you do the math, you will get the answer. Well, when you work it out, the, the temperature comes out to be 384.6 Kelvin. I've not shown the math here. Uh, I'm quite sure anybody can work that out with a little care. So that's how that problem is worked out.
Now this shows a uh, convection currents in a home where you have the what is called the gravity furnace. Uh, it just simply shows that as uh, air becomes hot, it becomes less dense and it begins to rise up and the cooler air uh, comes down and takes its place and then it gets hot and the same process is repeated. And that, so that is a convection which is being used to heat the home during winter.